You're listening to the Second Look Podcast, where we take a closer look at what we're learning each Sunday at Connection Church to help you grow in your walk with Christ. Here are your hosts, Pastor Joe Terreri and Pastor Dan DeRochers. Welcome to The Second Look. My name is Dan. And I'm Joe. And we're here talking about live free or die. But first, hey, Joe. Good morning, Dan. I'm pretty sure my kids are legalists. (laughs) At least Anna is. Oh, definitely. Kids are the best legalists. Joe, this morning, this literal morning. And fundamentalist Baptist. Keep going. (laughs) This literal morning, from our upstairs, Yes, Anna yells, Mom, Piper didn't use soap. <laughs> yep. yep. Three times. Three, yeah. yeah. And therefore does not deserve love or to be accepted and deserves chastisement. This is legalism. Yeah. Using soap's great. It's true. In it's fact, true. when Piper came downstairs, I squirted some foam soap in her hand yeah. and we... and. You know, help, uh, helped her wash them. Oh, good. Uh, but yeah, legalism is so much fun it, to enforce oh. on other people. Yeah. Oh, it's <laughs> great. It's great. And you know, the nice thing is when you can have a leg up on people, like you do it first and they haven't done it yet. And then you remind them how they're failing. Yeah. This reminds me of a relationship with some of my friends. This is what we do. <laughs> it's very healthy. <laughs> Joe, um, since this is the second look, yeah. I thought maybe <laughs> we could discuss something that didn't happen yesterday, which was you did wa- wear a fun shirt. I did. But that was not the entirety of the planned outfit. No, it wasn't. I really wanted to wear shorts and a t-shirt yesterday. And I also had purchased some fake earrings and uh, some fake tattoos that I was going to put on. But I decided not to, Dan, because as the day Sunday draweth nigh, I just had the sense where I just didn't want to be distracting because I do like... I think it would have been funny. I also think, like, if you're new, it's like, what's happening right now? <laughs> Who is this guy? <laughs> Who is this guy? Like, uh, and and I also think, like, I didn't want people thinking too much about that. So I kind of let that go. And I, it, it, you know, sometimes Dan, you have ideas on Tuesday, and you're like, that's a really good idea. We're doing it. <laughs> and then as it gets close, you're like, you know. And I'm sure there's people listening like, you should have done it. And I'm like, John yeah, Myers. I, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I should have done it maybe, but I also didn't want that to be what people left thinking about. Yeah. Like I really wanted people to leave thinking about how there's a legalist inside all of us. And I don't say that judgmentally. Like I see that in my own heart. Yeah. Um, part of what you talked about was uh, that Jesus died so that all of humanity could be free. Yes. And that freedom in Christ and why... Uh, why we would ever choose to be a slave again. Yeah. Um, and that really is what we're trying to do when we when we make kind of these human rules about non-explicit sin issues, right? Right. right. And, and, and I would even say at the core of legalism, the false belief that so- somehow you can add to your own acceptability to God, we can even follow God's rules. And thinks it, and make him, and make, and believe that we're more acceptable to him because we're following even his commands. Like we never follow God's commands to make ourselves more acceptable. We we follow God's commands because we love him and because we want to just please him with our life and because he's God, he's Lord. And when he, and it's like by faith we obey because we believe what how God says life works best is what's true because he created us and the universe and our consciences and our hearts and our brains and uh, and consequences. So yeah, we, we got to always be careful. Even when it comes down to God's commands, we're not obeying those even to be acceptable to God. But yet the same, the emphasis yesterday was over becoming acceptable to God through man-made rules. Yeah, and I want to dig more into that. But first, we have a uh, question from a listener Great. that came through our website. And by the way, I haven't heard these questions yet, so this is good. It's true. This, yes. is, the fir- this yeah. is the first listen yes. on the second look. Let's go ahead and roll that. Dear Pastors Joe and Dan, yesterday's message concerning legalism was enlightening and piercing. I'm convinced that many Christians have dour attitudes because they are bound by legalism and on a subconscious level refuse to take the free gift of salvation, i.e. earning culture. Why do you think this is? Why are there so many miserable Christians? Furthermore, do real Christians fast for 40 days and nights on a regular basis? Do they fast at all? Thanks for all that you do. 
Great set of questions. Oh my gosh, those are two different questions, but important questions. So why are there so many cranky Christians? <laughs> uh, what a great opportunity for me to be judgmental, um, as if I know what's happening in everyone's heart. However, I do think at the core of that question is an important, is, like I, I hear that, and I do think like the lack of joy in the Christian life comes from a lack of acceptance of God's love and grace into our life. And, and listen, I'm not talking about when we lose someone we love or we're battling cancer or we're, uh, you know, we're, we're going through a difficult time in our marriage. Like there are legitimate reasons when we have to really fight for joy. But I do love the question because I do not always think that uh, God's people are a great advertisement for joy that comes from knowing Jesus. It's true. And listen, we live in a broken world, and there's a lot of heartache, and there's a lot of unmet expectation, and there's a lot of broken dreams, and there's a lot of loss. And so I just want to acknowledge that. And, and, and I also want to acknowledge that Jesus himself was a man of sorrows, well acquainted with grief. Um, and so we need to be honest that that even the Apostle Paul says, we are sorrowful, yet always rejoicing. So there is that tension in the Christian life between sorrow and joy. And yet at the same time, that joy needs to continue to be uh, a part of our lives. It's a, it's a sign of the Spirit in our life because we are so deeply loved by God and we are so deeply um, forgiven and accepted and whole because of what Jesus Christ has done. So I do think there is a direct correlation in our lives between our acceptance of God's grace and our joy. Now, here's what we also need to be careful of. Joy does not mean a plastered smile on your face and everything's going great, brother. Right. You know, joy can come from a deep place. And and we all have different personalities too. Like some of us are more melancholy in our personality and some of us are more gregarious. And, and so we don't want to be legalistic around what joy looks like. That's good. But we do want to be honest that joy is a part of the Christian life because joy is a part of God's character. What about the question about fasting? Yeah, love that. Um, I have a love, hate, hate, hate relationship with fasting. Um, so I don't like to fast, okay? I, I'm not good at it. Um, I don't do it a lot. But here's the thing about fasting. Fasting, what I see in Scripture is two different things. Jesus literally teaches in Matthew chapter 6, when you fast. So Jesus assumes that the time would come when his disciples would fast. But it's just assumed. There's no rule around it. There's no regularity to it. There's no prescription. It's just when you fast. So fasting is part of the Christian life. Here's where it becomes legalism. You should fast when I fast. Right, right. Now, I've there's been great men of God and women of God throughout the ages of the church who have fasted one day a week or t two days a week. And listen, we can learn from them. There is something about fasting that is actually renewing for the Christian life. So I want to be so clear here. We should obey Jesus. Like fasting um, is part of the Christian life. How often? That's between you and the Lord. And how long, too. And how right? long, right. Uh, and it's interesting, a lot of the fasts that I think um, we see are, are a lot shorter. Like, you know, there was a big trend years ago, and some churches are still doing this with the Daniel fast, yep. which just basically— like 21 days. Yeah, like just basically how I interpret that is, is what am I allowed to eat? Yeah, um, like the whole 30. And, yeah, yeah. It's <laughs> like, you know, so I'm not down on the Daniel fast other than the fact that like, that's not fasting, you're eating. And, and I, even people are like, oh, I'm doing a media fast. That's fine, but that's not, not fasting. fasting. Yeah. Fasting is when we go without food for spiritual purposes. And so I think, you know, starting with a day or, or two— when it comes to a 40-day fast, it'd be like, talk to your doctor about that. Right. There's a lot of people who should not be attempting that. I know Jesus fasted for 40 days. You're not him. <laughs> um, so I do think we, we you can do a 40-day fast. And I've known people who have done it, and they've talked about really awesome things that God's done in their life through that. So if you want that, do it. But legalism says you should do what I'm doing. Yeah. Legalism says I'm more holy than you because I did it. The gospel says Jesus makes us holy. So when it comes to a spiritual practice like fasting, Jesus assumed we would fast, and that's where it needs to end. 
and how you express that is between you and God. And at the same time, we should challenge ourselves to do what Jesus said. We should not say, because I just said that, oh, fasting doesn't matter. No, Jesus assumes we should do it. Is there fasting in your life? But let's not make rules around it. Yeah, the, it's the whole rules piece and versus heart piece right. that is, I mean, that that is the differentiation, right? Right. I want to step back and kind of go back. By the way, thanks for those questions. They were awesome. Thank you very much. Um, So I want to go back to kind of the the kids situation, because I think when it comes to kind of training up your child in the ways of Christ Mm -hmm. and and developing uh, their faith and developing their heart for Jesus, sometimes, I mean, I, I just think about when I was growing up, it, I feel like probably what I was taught was do this and don't do that because I don't know that my heart was ready for the gray area of have a heart for Jesus and you'll want to do those things. Yes, but that's exactly why God gave the law in the first place. Even Galatians 4, I believe, talks about how the law served as a tutor, as a teacher until Christ came. And so even with rules for our kids. I said yesterday in all three services, rules can't change your children's heart. But that doesn't mean we shouldn't have rules for our kids. That's good. And it doesn't mean that God doesn't have rules for us and he had rules for his people in Israel. I'm not saying rules are bad. Rules don't transform. But what rules do is they show us what what it's like to be submissive. But what can actually happen is, is Rules can become a place where we're like, okay, like this is what it looks like to honor the authority in my life. Because the real heart issue for us, Dan, all of us, is that we hate authority and we hate being told what to do and we hate God's authority until we come to Christ. Like that's just, I mean, that's what atheism is. That's what all false religion is. We hate authority authority. That's what happened in Genesis chapter 3. That's what's been happening ever since the fall. We are authority-hating people. And I'm not saying that's the only thing that's wrong with the world, but that's at the core of what's wrong with the world. We hate authority. That's why, like, seriously, that's why, like, when we read commands in both Peter and Paul in their writings to pray for our governing authorities, Christians often will say, yeah, but... (laughs) And it would be like, no, like, there's no yeah buts there. Like, we're commanded to pray for our leaders. And if we're not doing that, what that's really revealing is, is we don't actually love all of God's word, number one. And number two, we don't love the authorities he's put over us. And so rules actually reveal where we are willing to be rebellious against God. When we think about legalism in the church... Sure. (sighs) I just I I wonder I would wonder your thoughts on kind of this hypothesis. Like sure. I wonder how much of legalism in the church is us looking acceptable to others more than trying to look acceptable to God. Mm. I think that's a huge part of it. And I think legalism is actually about conformity mm. and uniformity. And so, you know, if we all wear suits and dresses to church and we all carry our Bibles with us and we're all going to vote, you know, this way. And, you know, we all send our kids to the same school. Like there is this sense where churches can become very homogeneous communities. We all look alike. We all do the same things. We all dress the same way. And, and, and listen, there could be things about that that create community but it's only good for the people who are in the community. That's good. That's actually not, like, that's not the call of Christ to go out into the world and make disciples of all nations. And to be a disciple is to be a follower of Jesus, not to conform and uniform Mm. into a certain mold that we say this is what holiness looks like. And so in the church, legalism says we all look the same. We're all doing the same things if you want to be accepted into this group. Mm -hmm. And that's why I went hard yesterday after things like education and dress and alcohol. And listen, I want to be so clear about alcohol. It's destroyed a lot of lives. You know, I had a grandfather who at the end of his life was an alcoholic. So, I mean, I have a very close friend who's, who, who lost his wife because of a drunk driver. So I, I, but at the same time, 
legalism says no, you know, people who love Jesus never would never drink alcohol. It's like we we're just not allowed to make up those rules. Yeah. And and really what we need here here's the thing that I think our whole culture struggles with and what we struggle with in the church. Nuance. We're That's really so bad at having nuanced conversations because we know it's just safer to think in black and white. And there are black and white things. Adultery, always wrong. Stealing, always wrong. Gossip, always wrong, right? Like there are things, like even if you keep reading in Colossians chapter three, Paul talks about things that are absolutely sinful. But when it comes to things that are issues of conscience, we need to be nuanced. And here's what nuance says. This is how I want to express my faith, but this is not how everyone needs to express. Like I'm I know that this is what I'm choosing, but it doesn't mean that everyone has to choose this in order for me to consider them in the family of God. Yeah. Because the only way to get into the family of God is choosing Jesus and and obeying Jesus, and then everything else becomes periphery. It becomes preference. And even with our preferences, we need to be super careful with those because even inadvertently, because we have preference and conviction around certain things, we need to keep those to ourselves, like in general, because then they can be of mode of acceptance for us. So let me give you an example. If you go to a church where everyone's homeschooling, and it's like, we're the homeschool church, now you have someone come into the church, they send their kids to a public school, they get wind that everyone's a homeschooler. Well, guess what? What are they going to feel as part of that church? unwelcome. Yeah. Listen, homeschooling can be wonderful. But if that's what if if that's an emphasis that's and and that kind of creeps up as an emphasis in the life of the church inadvertently, it actually says to the lost being a Christian is giving your life to Jesus and then homeschooling your children. Giving your life to Jesus and wearing a suit on Sunday giving your life to Jesus and wearing jeans and a t-shirt on Sunday. Like it can go, we can become legalistic around our freedoms. So that's why we need nuance. We need humility. And listen, I think, you know, I think it's really wonderful if we want to have conversations like interpersonally over a cup of coffee, over dinner around the merits of Christian education or public school education, like, or our political views, we can do that. But as the people of God, Jesus Christ is what? supreme over all and how his supremacy looks in our lives like we might express that a little differently but jesus needs to be the rallying cry of the church i imagine that this has to be tough and especially important for those in leadership especially for you joe like you just you just said like we have to sort of de-emphasize our personal preference yeah for the sake of being able to have those nuanced conversations. I was thinking about Dave Ramsey, yeah. right? Railing on the radio about his seven baby steps and living a debt-free life. Big Ramsey guy, yeah. by the way, zero nuance, Yeah. right? Zero. People, right. His entire 25-year radio career has been based <laughs> on everyday listeners calling in with a matter of nuance right. where he holds this very legalistic line as right. as to his plan not gospel not scripture well right. some scripture but not sure. not, the, not the gospel right because most people in that world got where they are because they misunderstand or misapply nuance right, right. right? you have to hold the line somewhere and so but but for this our line is the gospel, right? Right, And it's all that other stuff where the nuance is that I imagine, here's my point, I imagine you have to be careful about your own beliefs and and (laughs) matters of your conscience because they're not necessarily uh, what is explicit in Scripture. Right, and I think even the way we do church and the way that... I dress and the way that I educate my own children and the way that um, I handle my own money and the way that we give, you know, I I need to be careful around all of those things Um, where we have biblical conviction. We are on, I am unapologetic where I have personal preference. We, we, we need to just hold those with open hand. And, And here's the other thing. 
at some level, the things we do are our preferences, how we do them. Like, like we could, I mean, I would eat, I would gladly go to a church where on Sunday morning, someone just stood up with an acoustic guitar and we sang three hymns and then someone preached for an hour, like with no bells and no, like on a personal level, that's fine. But that's about me. Like, that's what I like. And so it, like we, when we do things at our church and when I do things in my personal life, we do have to say like, this is a way it's not the way. And for those of us who are reading along, and not to be legalistic, but those of us who are reading along with our Bible reading plan, I love what Peter says in Acts chapter 4 to the Sanhedrin. There is one name under heaven by which man can be saved. And he's talking about Jesus. And then in Colossians, chapter 1, verses 15 through 20, talk about how Jesus is the head of the church and so that in all things he might have the supremacy. And so the drumbeat of Scripture and the drumbeat of Colossians is Christ is all. Christ is all. And and, and how in Christ being all in our life, we may express that in how we educate our kids. Like, but I'll just use education as an example. I think some people send their kids to public school because they'd love to send their kids to a Christian school. They can't afford it. However, I also think some people send their kids to public school because they love to be involved in their community, meet new people, and 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 believe that their family can be a light amongst a sea of lost people. And I would say, that sounds very missional to me. And at the same time, um, for us, we send our kids to Christian school, and we have our reasons for that, and we love that community, and God's, God's given us great influence in that community, and I'm seeing that God is using our influence there to literally allow us to build Christ into people. Yeah. And so, like, but when we make a rule, Dan, that's when it all falls apart. Yeah. Because if we make a rule around our preferences, guess what would happen? You and I actually couldn't work together because we think a little bit differently about that. But we can be awesome friends and we can work hard on the mission of this church, which is what? To lift up the name of Jesus yeah. Christ, to connect every man, woman, and child, not to our convictions about education or politics or scruples. And a scruple is like something like how you think about like alcohol, but to but to win everyone to Jesus Christ and to follow him and to and to love the mission and to love one another. We we do hold fast on the using soap when you wash your hands. Yeah. I mean, because we all live through 2020. We all <laughs> used so much hand Would sanitizer. You, could you just look in that camera and address Piper and just encourage her? Oh, sure. Her Piper, uh, Pastor Joe here. I just want to let you know that um, when you didn't wash your hands this morning and your little sister called you on it, I just want you to know God still loves you. And if you forget to wash your hands again, it's okay. Um, you're not personally responsible for the spread of disease. But please wash your hands. You won't regret it. This has been another episode of Amazing. Another episode of The Second Look. You can catch this sermon and much more, Piper, at our website, yes. cometoconnect.com. Have a great week.